van de SNIA fonds um, en uh, ondersteunt uh, ja, innovatieve uh, projecten. I start with a short introduction about the SIDN fund. It's a fund which is funded by SIDN domain name registry in the Netherlands. It was funded uh, one and a half years ago and uh, our goal is to search for innovative internet projects which serve uh, the common interest, so not commercial projects, but uh, projects for the, for the common interest and for the people, the end users, using the internet to keep it a strong environment. Uh, well, to seek for future solutions, as the keynote speaker mentioned as well. Um, I will do a short presentation, and after my presentation, I will give the floor to two of the projects we fund with the SIBM project. Um, so I will do it very rapidly. Uh, as I mentioned, we search for uh, innovative internet projects with guts and disruptive potential, we say, uh, who do not. Uh, find finances on, in other places, so not for venture capitalists or not, not from uh, uh, normal funds who do not have a focus on the internet. Uh, one of the main things is that we search for projects for the common benefits, as I mentioned, and uh, those projects uh, must share their knowledge during the project, so they not, cannot keep the knowledge within the project, but we really ask them to share their knowledge uh, online or in the physical world. Uh, below that you see our, uh, our tool seminar, our targets. We, we are looking for projects who uh, support uh, the strongness of the internet, who use internet uh, for the uh, benefit of the society as a whole. And uh, the last one is to empower the user, because a lot of users do not know what they are using, and we think it's really important that people know uh, how the internet works, not only uh, as a consumer, but also as uh, a tool where people can um, do things and create things with. Uh, in short, we have two kinds of uh, fundings. One of them is called the Pioneers Funding. It's up to 10,000 uh, euros. Those projects are, uh, can be projects from, a, from an idea of working to a prototype, so there doesn't need to be an audience already. Uh, we have other fundings up to 75,000 euros and there we ask for a working prototype with a working uh, target group or, or more target groups uh, so we can help scale up those projects. Um, I skipped this one. Uh, one of the projects uh, we also do, we call it uh, cooperation projects and then uh, we see uh, uh, issue in society which, which is really urgent and we as a fund try to uh, donate money but also help these projects uh, grow much faster. One of the first ones is called uh, Codeur, Stichting Codeur and they try to have coding lessons in grammar school uh, in our system within three years. They developed a matching tool between uh, developers and uh, grammar schools so if anyone here wants to give a, a teaching lesson in grammar schools about coding, you can go to this website, apply for it, and the, the system search a grammar school in your surroundings, and you can teach there every Friday, or only once, or, or whatever you want. And they also developed uh, open uh, lessons which can be used by grammar school teachers, because the biggest problem, of course, is there, because they do not know what they're talking about. And these lessons help those teachers uh, giving coding lessons in the grammar schools. Uh, what we did last year is also uh, started the Internet Subscription Prize. It uh, already started, of course, a long time ago with Access Roll and Brinkhoff Advocaten. Uh, but we now joined with Google, Brinkhoff Advocaten and Greenhost, uh, handing out uh, subscription prizes in the Netherlands. Those are the winners of uh, this year. Yeah, there. Not here, there are many. No. <laughs> yeah. There and here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I cannot mention all of them, but uh, the winner of our SIDN prize was, uh, is Luz Derex, and she did an anthropological uh, investigation in the privacy movement. So that she went to Berlin and she did a lot of talks there and in Amsterdam. And, well, and she had a really interesting uh, survey about how the privacy movement is coming along in the Netherlands and uh, in Europe especially.
Um, what we do as a fund is not only uh, give funding, but we want to create a uh, knowledge community with all the projects we fund. Uh, we try to uh, give them coaching and mentoring in this regard. And we are setting up cooperation with different funds who do not have a focus on the internet yet, like Stichting Doom or Adesium. There, there, there are a lot of funds in the Netherlands who are focused on society but do not have this internet focus yet. So we try to work with them to uh, create separate calls. Um, and in the next phase we also uh, are setting up, uh, how do you call it, a ne next stage investor movement. So if the projects are finished with us, we want to help them um, reaching out to uh, other investors who can help them further. Because our funds, although we have money, are limited in this regard. Um, well, I skipped this one. Um, then, in short, I will mention some projects we are funding right now. Uh, one of them is the white box system. I don't know if you know it. It's a, it's a, um, a secure way where patients and uh, doctors can communicate, not using the, uh, the, the commercial system, but it's a peer-to-peer -peer system where uh, patients and doctors can communicate uh, free and safe. Another one is uh, the anti ddos Wasstraat. It's a system uh, where uh, DDoS attacks can be uh, registered in the early stages. And uh, this system is uh, more cheap. Uh, so a lot of ISPs, smaller ISPs, can use this system as well. So they don't need to buy the, the, the uh, more expensive commercial systems. Um, the NetAid kit. I don't know if you know that one. It's uh, developed by Free Press Unlimited. It's this kit. It's just uh, launched one month ago. Uh, Free Press Unlimited uh, developed it for uh, journalists in difficult countries like Sudan so that they can communicate secure through Tor or VPN. Uh, they now want to develop it for a bigger market and our uh, dream with this project is that you can buy it, I don't know, within one year, two years at the media market or the HEMA. Uh, just for 5 or 10 euros so people can uh, communicate freely on the internet through Tor and through VPN. Uh, you probably know of the Things Network. It's a, a network for, with LoRaWAN technology. Uh, and they, uh, uh, well, they, they are uh, setting up a Things Network. They started off in Amsterdam and they're now going very rapidly all around the world. They're on already 250 cities. Uh, using this kind of uh, framework. Um, then we have one project, it's called Internet Tuchan for uh, Refugees and Migrants. It's uh, setting up Wi-Fi because uh, we think not only uh, sleeping, eating, but also internet is one of the basic needs for people, especially when you are running and uh, fleeing away from your own country. Um, then one a project, it's called White Spots. It's launched two or three weeks ago, and this is a project we want to discuss about uh, the matter if we should be connected all over the world and what happens in those spots where there's no internet yet. Uh, they launched a really interesting app, you can download it, and then you can see all the connections you have in your own environment. They launched it in the Netherlands, but they're going to launch it all over the world soon. And uh, another project is the uh, DHCP kit. It's de developed by Senator Stefan, who's walking around here as well. And we're helping him with that. And then I want to give the floor not to Bodo, Balaj Bodo, but first to uh, Ivan, who's going to talk about that. And my call is that if you have an, a, a project which can, uh, you can apply for with us. We open, we open our calls in June again, and they close in September. So take a look at our web website, sidnfonds.nl, uh, if your project is applicable. I'll be presenting those. those uh, we, it's uh, from an organization called Dan.org. And uh, with that, we want to make a privacy hub for the Internet of Things. So, Start. But what is that? First, let's mention the 
your, your router, you have it home. It's, uh, for some, it's still an alien device, a little black box that is staying somewhere in your cabinet. And uh, all your traffic goes through it. So the, uh, the problem of the router is that it's not even owned by you, it's leased. So it has, uh, that way it has legal backdoors. So when you call your ISP, your internet is not working. Then you call them and legally they log in. They see what's on your network and magically fix it. So how do we deal with this consciousness and awareness? DAOS works as a transparent proxy that facilitates the awareness in the network and keeping you aware of what's happening. What's going in your network, what's going out, and what's happening inside the local area. It provides a central point of self-control for all tra internet traffic. DAOS acts as the DNS and the HCP server. Optionally, it tunnels and encrypts your DNS traffic uh, with DNS script proxy. An interesting note is people use VPNs as for privacy and security, but uh, usually VPNs do not tunnel your DNS traffic. It goes through your router to your home, and uh, it was used in espionage to profile people based on the websites that they visit. So this may sound complex, and the core feature for DAOs is to hide the complexity of such a setup while still keeping all the functionality. We are not hiding things from users. <coughs> this picture is obviously made by a hippie, not a designer. <laughs> but <laughs> we have pull and push models of getting information. The, the pull model is, for example, when you log into your router and and look at your router's logs, it's usually painful, it's formatted in H ugly HTML and it's really hard to do it, to read it. Does anyone here look at their router logs? Usually, every day, you must go through a lot of pain if you read that. It's very well sorted. Yeah, sometimes. We use the pull model, which means, we use the push, sorry, we use the push model where when a certain event in the network happens, it's pushed towards you and you get the event. So, for example, you can hear a sound in your room. It can show visualization on your TV. Basically, you can interface it with anything. And this, uh, this kind of stuff creates awareness about the context that are being created. It allows us to become aware of what is happening in our networks. And what, where our, our devices are connecting to. And uh, the important thing is that it offers us to switch off some devices. Like, if we don't want our fridge to talk to the grocery store, when we are out of beer, we will tell it to not connect to the grocery store. If you wish, you can also let it work. This image also, someone told us to change it because the person in the disconnect part looks less happy, but when we managed to disconnect stuff, we were super happy. <laughs> uh, what I found out when I was dissecting applications with the, using DAOs is that uh, 10 years ago, when a computer program opened a connection to the internet without our consent, it was called spyware. These days, uh, We've been spoiled by many smartphones and they're always constantly syncing your data. When you enable Wi-Fi on your smartphone, it connects all to all kinds of services and syncs what happened in the meantime. Uh, Firefox, for example, when you open a new tab, it makes a connection to Mozilla.org on its own. Do you have a video of this? Not now. Sorry. Maybe. Go to the next a little bit about the code. It's mostly written in shell and C. We try to keep it very minimal, fast and portable. It implements a modular plugin architecture which allows you to use any executable 
that exists, you can just plug it into those. You can use any language you want. We do complete process separation. It's very, very fast and uh, very super stable. And it allows you to make transparent proxies in your house, like having Tor or Netsuku parallel networks on your router without having to install that software on your computer. So someone comes to your house and you can tell them, hey, now you're in the onion and you didn't have to install Tor, for example. And uh, DAOs and all of its components are, of course, free software. The, what I here call database, it's not really a database, but let's say the central dynamic database of DAOs is Redis. It's also written in C, very small. And uh, it allows us to subscribe to the events in our network via publish and subscribe channel. And they can easily be exported to WebSockets, OpenSound Control, MQTT, or you can also get raw data out of Redis and implement your own if you wish. It's very easy. Uh, Redis, as it's a database, it does not keep logs on its own. It's, everything is real time. And if you want to log, you must willingly switch it off. We call it switch it on. We call it a feature. And uh, we also have some fancy stuff. <laughs> this is the web interface of DAOs. It's made so you can actually use your phone in your network. And you see the host names, the manufacturer, in the MAC address when it was last seen on the networks. You can get more verbose info on a specific device and then you have the option to switch off the device. If it's an unknown device, it's very easy to switch it off or on. And uh, also we have, when we gather the data from Redis, we can visualize it. And this was a live performance meeting over two days. And what you see here is uh, these pawn like figures are devices, and these are all the, the circles are all DNS requests. So we can visualize what's going on on our network in real time. And this now, is, this is just one of the one of the ways to show it. You can use WebSockets and use Alchemy JS for a visualization tool. You can export these events to open sound control, use pure data, and make music out of it. <laughs> in, and it's very useful in your house if you want to be subtle about something happening, something weird happening on your network, you can have a speaker just putting out some sound and a certain event happens and that event can be in. So what are, what are the clusters? It's, uh, these are all DNS requests. So yeah. we separate here the dot .com from the rest of the so ah, right, right, right. We separate it from the rest, it's in groups. We also have a, an initiative called the main list, so it's on GitHub, where we separate the big companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Adobe, Apple. We separate them. Mm, what else? Ah, yes. So this was over the course of two days. And what I noticed. It's the entire internet is uh, 930 websites big. <laughs> so this is the internet for about 200 people. That's a note. How do you judge my wife's Apple computer, period? You know, I'm sitting there and she does something and, and the Apple file pops up a nice little alert box. Do you want to allow this application to connect to this port on this server? Uh, just once, never, always. Yes. I, here am I, a technical person. I find it very hard to judge the relative importance, the weight, because I have no idea what the content is that the, that's going to that site. I could just be bitchy and say, you know, evil system of the heater from hell, no way. But what am I losing? It's that subjective thing is, it makes a great difference and it's very hard to get a grip on. Yes, but that, was, uh, that was allows you to see what's going on. And once you do, you do it, you can 
click yes and see what happens. And see what happens when you click no, if it's still connected. So anyway, I'm near the end. You can find those on .eu or, and our source code is on GitHub. GitHub slash guide slash dose. Thank you. It was short but sweet, I hope. <laughs> Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then I'm a social scientist working with information lawyers at the Institute for Informatik at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, our project uh, is a research project actually uh, funded by the SEDM uh, Potentials uh, uh, Fund uh, and our, uh, our project is about trying to identify whether uh, in the upcoming Dutch elections any political micro-targeting takes place. Uh, the, um, the, the problem you might be familiar with uh, and it's a problem uh, raging at the moment in the US. This is uh, a news clipping from a couple of uh, months ago when uh, Ted Cruz was still in the race. Uh, effectively, the US political campaign, the current uh, presidential campaign, uses uh, political micro-targeting and uses social networks uh, heavily. Uh, and uh, <coughs> it seems like that uh, Facebook is uh, taking the central uh, space in that. Uh, just a few quotes from this uh, article. Uh, due to the data protection and privacy uh, particularities in the US, it's easy for political entities to compile large data sets on potential voters or on the network, with, uh, which they can combine all kinds of different sources from uh, uh, credit card uh, purchase data, uh, credit scores on all kinds of commercially available data sources. And Facebook allows them to upload uh, their campaign database and match them to actual Facebook profiles. Uh, and that gives an unprecedented uh, opportunity for political parties or political entities to actually make sure that you are targeted with the right message, that you uh, actually uh, uh, have the highest possibility or potential to respond to. And, uh, uh, and you know, this is a, a, a competition for ad spending, this is a, a, a competition for campaign spending, and the, if the promise is that you are much better at targeting individual voters than a radio station or a, 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 a television uh, campaign, then the um, campaign spending will move towards this medium, and we see that um, uh, the Cruz campaign at, the, at uh, the beginning of the year was already spending 10,000 US dollars per day on, uh, on uh, Facebook uh, targeting, uh, which is uh, so political micro-targeting, apart from Facebook, has its own problems, uh, and I will discuss them a little bit further, but uh, there is another layer of problems on top of the general what's the issue with political micro-targeting, and that it, it favors Facebook. Uh, Facebook is actually an, an effective monopoly, and it just helps uh, it grow stronger. Uh, <coughs> And the, the projected uh, spending on social media based political spending is projected to go home stand uh, between uh, 2025 and 2016. You know, there are many issues here, um, uh, uh, but and mo these are mostly American problems. Uh, but what we can say is that it's already happening in the US. Uh, we know very little about this whole process and how it it will affect our democracies, or public spheres, or political parties uh, as individuals, voters, as well as political uh, parties. And it may or may not happen in the upcoming election. So what we uh, decided to do is to take a, a closer look uh, at the issue of political micro-targeting and how we can set up a monitoring system with which we can assess the relative uh, pros and cons of political micro-targeting. Uh, I, uh, this uh, Guardian article paints a super scary uh, picture. Uh, of course, this uh, and the and the and the cons are quite obvious. 
uh, you can just you know uh, fragment uh, the public sphere, you can fragment the democracy, you can uh, use this tool to polarize already existing uh, opinions. And we see that from the Austrian elections that uh, uh, polarization is an issue by itself. It can lead to manipulating voters. It can lead to dishonest uh, political parties. So these are the all the scary things that we uh, want to identify if they happen. Uh, there are also promises, uh, so ambition for that, that, that uh, it may lower the entry barrier for new political entities. Right? If, it's, if it's a cheap alternative to reach potential voters, then it may help uh, to, to widen uh, the, uh, the number of political parties. It, it, it could also increase political participation. If you are pinned uh, with the right message, then you might be more likely to go out and vote than if you are uh, bombarded with a general uh, uh, message. Uh, it could also lead to more uh, attention and more discussion of particular issues rather than you know, discussing uh, things that affect all of us. Uh, the discussions that can start to include uh, issues uh, that are only affect a small uh, group of the electorate, but it can be still relevant for them. So really, there is both a promise and a threat in that, and we want to know uh, what's happening in that space. How do we do that? Uh, we are actually uh, hopefully, um, the technology is ready, and we are now designing the recruitment phase. But what we are trying to do is actually to man in the middle uh, 1,600 Dutch citizens uh, when they browse the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. With their consent, of course. So we are trying to uh, recruit them in a way that they understand what they sign up for. <laughs> uh, and we try to design the processes where, uh, which make sure that we are not only legally compliant, but ethically uh, unimpeachable. Uh, but still, what we are trying to do is to capture uh, data uh, traffic uh, between uh, certain websites and their browsers. It's a, uh, we have a wide list of more than, a little more than 300 different websites, which includes not just the political parties and major Dutch news sources, but also the BBC, uh, the Google search, and the Facebook, uh, and other social media. And we gather data for a number of months, uh, hopefully two years, uh, in collab collaboration with uh, uh, WIS and Center Data, which is a global based um, research company. Uh, and uh, we use this data to identify a number of trends, uh, identify personalization taking place in the commercial field, sphere, whether you get a different price than him because of gender differences or, or where you live. Uh, we try to look into personalization in the news domain, whether you get a different uh, version of the same article as I do because I'm Hungarian and you're Dutch. Uh, we are trying to look into uh, health communication and we are looking into political microclimating as well. Um, the team who's doing that is uh, uh, the Institute for Information Law, uh, who are uh, privacy, consumer protection lawyers, uh, uh, information lawyers, the Amsterdam School of Communication Research, who are experts in political communication, um, and uh, you. Uh, and uh, when I mean you, it's not like the, you are the person of the year, but rather we need you in a number of different roles. We need you as a citizen. Uh, we need you also as a data scientist. So if you are interested in analyzing large data sets, we can have a job, a job opening uh, soon. Uh, so this is it, and we are very grateful for SED Alphonse uh, for having, uh, uh, allowing us to work in this domain, and we're going to uh, have the first results at the end of the, uh, this year, where we hopefully going to release a uh, dashboard, uh, with which you can actually have, uh, you can monitor the heartbeat of the political uh, campaign as it happens uh, through various online media. Thank you. Yes. Um, actually, it's more than one, but it has to do with uh, uh, the relation with the, uh, the user. Yeah. Um, when, so you say uh, uh, people are willing and blah, blah, blah. How, uh, uh, is there, is the list of sites you monitor public? Yes. And how do you uh, uh, deal with um, Okay, I'm going to use this browser for this, and I'm going to use another browser for something else. Uh, so, what's what, I mean? What's what, is there some kind of contract of usage with the with the participants? Uh, of, we always want to uh, have. 
the opportunity of the user to opt out, so they can stop monitoring anytime, uh, or they can suspend monitoring anytime. Uh, they can suspend monitoring by the way using the incognito uh, mode of the browser. Uh, but there are several uh, uh, stages where we limit ourselves, we limit our, uh, the surveillance uh, post technical possibilities enabled by the fact that we move traffic through an MEK proxy. Uh, the first limit is uh, setting this uh, 300 plus uh, uh, URLs that are on the whitelist, which we uh, actually track. So we do not track dirtypictures.com, we do not track thunder.com, but we track the whole scout in uh, The second layer is that we uh, uh, maintain, we develop and maintain a large set of filters at the proxy level. So before actually saving data to the disk, uh, we live uh, remove uh, sensitive information, passwords, login details, names, third-party information, anything that is not related to the whitelisted websites we would like to collect. And then uh, we store uh, the data encrypted and we don't allow access to the raw data set. But we do allow uh, and we do invite researchers to uh, ask research questions uh, for which we can produce ad hoc queries on this whole data set and we can provide properly anonymized uh, data sets that we, are, uh, that we will release uh, uh, free. So the idea is that the raw data set which may contact, may contain, con uh, may contain, <laughs> may contain uh, uh, third party data or uh, anything that would help third parties to de anonymize or respondent. We keep it uh, secret, but we do, allow, uh, do release uh, data sets for analysis which have been uh, properly sanitized. How do you ensure that your respondents are a representative sample of the Dutch population? So the, I, this is why we work with uh, Center Data. Center Data uh, has a commercial uh, panel, uh, and that is the Center Panel, and it also has a publicly funded uh, uh, research panel of 8,000 individuals, I guess. Uh, it's called List Panel, uh, and both uh, of them are actually representative uh, in the main sociodemographic as uh, on the Dutch society. And we teamed up not just as a client but as a partner for this research because we hopefully uh, managed to persuade them that uh, as Nielsen uh, uh, screen measurement or TV measurement was the central instrument to know what's happening in society in the TV age, we need a research panel which enables us to see how it's a society, what happens in society and other applications in the 21st century. So we are trying to build on the long run a research infrastructure which enables us to, to undo this fragmentation which is happening with some personal services. Okay. Uh, so the, but going back to your question, uh, uh, we have a uh, 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 survey population which is representative, but we have to actually pers persuade them to sign up. And there it's going to be a self selection bias because none of you will actually be very inclined to uh, sign up due to privacy reasons, or at least I hope. But maybe uh, we can, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, at least we will know because we know the panel how our sample is biased. Uh, and maybe we can offer a, a proposition to the individual respondents when we recruit them to actually maybe uh, weigh their privacy concerns against the potential benefits that this research may produce. Uh, meaning that you know, if you don't share your data, your Facebook feed, uh, or parts of your Facebook feed with us, we'll never know what's happening to us or to happen to each other, or what's ha what are the effects of. Uh, how Facebook distributes news uh, on an aggregate level. So that's a and that's a tough trade-off. We hope that at the end of the day we'll be able to design uh, the recruitment process in a way that we are able to explain that in a convincing way. To um, continue on that path, would it be possible to create your own uh, more or less ghost army of users instead of using real users? So prior to your research, you could. Uh, establish certain uh, uh, properties of these uh, people that you're looking for 
to uh, gain insight in, into uh, which sites they're um, visiting and then create these users automatically. So you're creating 1,500 people, different types of people, different types of profiles and use those with something like a, 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 a testing framework to see what the results are. That way you could completely move real people out of the uh, equation. Yeah, uh, we've looked into the options of this soft puppet, uh, soft puppet approach, yeah. or very puppet approach. Uh, but uh, to use a, uh, an example of you know, what is the difference between a soft puppet approach and a approach, uh, you can use puppets to actually you know, feed particular input to a black box and then reverse engineer yes. it by comparing the differences in the output. That would be like, uh, how do you reverse engineer how a car works, right? You try to you know, push the levers and buttons and you realize that the, the wheel turns. Uh, we are not interested in actually reverse engineering the car. What we are interested in is how people drive. Mm -hmm. uh, how people interact with algorithmic services. We are not interested, we, we don't believe that uh, we are able to reverse engineer the, the recommendation uh, engine of Facebook. Uh, but we are interested in how people actually engage with uh, algorithmic recommendations. When do they rely on them without questioning them? When are they pushing back? When are they uh, 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 prefer human uh, human alternatives to algorithmic agents? When are they just uh, uh, get angry when they realize that the price has changed because they locked in versus they are not locked in? Okay, so, so you're so you're also um, more or less um, inviting the people that are participant in in your research and showing them certain results, whether they're true or not to see what the results are of, well, the behavior of the people. Uh, uh, the, there, the is, there is the possibility to do that and we uh, hope to go down that road later, but uh, this is not our key goal. Our key goal is to, to oversee how people interact with each other in an algorithmically defined okay. environment and how they interact with algorithmic agents when it comes uh, to this uh, uh, value opportunity. Can people use app blockers when they're participating? Actually, uh, I was uh, busy emailing because uh, we need to ask people what kind of uh, uh, plugins they already have that might in interfere with our research. So, Ghost V, App Lock, uh, no, no script. Uh, uh, we just compiled 20 or 30 uh, plugins that might affect. Uh, and now we are uh, screening people based on what kind of pre installed plugins they have to know whether that what percentage of the individuals uh, are to be expected to have something already installed which might limit our ability to see what they are seeing. Another, sorry, I have another question. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have contact patterns with political parties and what do you expect would be the outcome of the research in 2017? Yeah, so we don't have uh, uh, prior contact. Uh, because that would, uh, yeah, we don't seek out contact on that. Uh, we, when we go public with a, with a dashboard, which uh, gives an oversight of, you know, like what are the trending topics in different media, are different in news media, uh, provide a different mix of the same news to different uh, groups, and then that will be, uh, that we very much hope that it will be very public and uh, uh, we hope to uh, uh, make a, a bang there. How it will affect uh, the Dutch elections? That's a good question. We don't expect that much that uh, political micro-targeting is a big thing in the Netherlands or in Europe in particular, but we see that political parties are hiring data scientists. So uh, something is taking place, but we can uh, Hope to achieve is that by making this monitoring infrastructure in use, we can uh, 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 influence political parties' behavior in a way that they have to factor into their decisions that there is somebody watching. And that's one of the value propositions that we try to sign up people with is that what we ask you to have is to make 
set of that type of things that are much longer for this and it is almost and this is the hope, this is the effect that we uh, hope to have is that when you see when, when, when you know you are they are watching or they are watching, then you prefer to behave less uh, you know. <laughs> Can you ask the people if they already take that into account before you ask them to do it? Uh, so uh, I think that all people in this room are already conscious that they are being watched. Yeah. That is the, the real problem is that there's a lot of people that are not not even thinking about it remotely. Mm -hmm. They just use the device and use all the information as if they were just free and open. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you, do you ask those, uh, uh, those people that you are going to monitor in advance if they are already conscious that they take into account that they might be uh, followed already? Okay, so the research, uh, uh, this, this uh, particular type of this, uh, this research uh -huh. is part of a large initiative of personalized communications, which is a research priority of the University of Amsterdam. And this, uh, and this uh, monitoring observation infrastructure is one layer of data that we collect. We also have a uh, recurring uh, 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 survey work, which we repeat every three months. And we ask people about their attitudes, about their knowledge, about their fears, about their practices through survey work. And we also uh, do uh, qualitative research. So we talk to people, talk to journalists, talk to different stakeholders and ask them about them. So the data, this is only one layer of data that we are working with. We don't survey these people uh, because we want to keep them as pristine as possible. We know a lot of them, a lot, a lot about them because they, the list of uh, variables are public. But we survey another uh, uh, more than a thousand individuals every three months and ask these kinds of questions. I'd like to thank you very much for uh, your projects both and the program of course. Um, I think new innovative programs can come to you, come to the website I think. Thank you very much.